I'm going to resume recording and just introduce the workshop. So today is Loneliness Awareness Week. Um, this was set up by the Marmalade Trust, who are a charity local to Bristol, um, as a way of tackling loneliness, like raising aware, awareness of loneliness and really trying to reduce the stigma associated with loneliness. Um, you know, loneliness is a completely normal human emotion. We all get lonely from time to time, but there are certain times in our lives that we're more impacted by loneliness or we feel lonely more frequently. And becoming a parent is one of those times. Um, research that was carried out by the Quorum Family and Child Care um, organization last year found that new parents were 56% more um, reported feeling lonely, 56%, sorry, that's really badly said, 56% of new parents reported feeling lonely, mm. um, and new mothers were twice as lonely um, as new fathers. I don't think there's ever been a more important time to discuss loneliness as we're obviously living through this pandemic and um, we're all having to socially distance from loved ones but also from the normal support networks that would be out there for new parents um, and you know our friends and family can no longer pop in and help at such an important time in your lives where you need more help <coughs> so today we're going to specifically um, look at loneliness in parenting and parent <clears throat> identity because that's also a big change you know as you go from becoming an individual or a couple to um, a mother or a father or that new family unit and how you sort of cope with some of that change. So I will start off by introducing our experts who are here today. Um, we will start, we'll go in alphabetical order, although on my screen they're all muddled up. Um, so Charlie Blythe, if you want to give us a wave, Charlie. Um, Charlie is a health visitor and she founded the Healthy Child Company um, as a result of many of the free services that were offered by health visitors um, slowly becoming unfunded and not being offered anymore. So a lot of um, the things that her company does is are the things that the health visitors used to do for you. So it's supporting um, lots of the topics like sleep, child development, um, children's health, parents' well-being, that real transition period um, from naught to five years old, okay? Um, then we have Claire Nutt, if you can give us a word, Claire. Claire is a midwife and a, ment and a specialist mental health midwife, actually. So she works for Bristol North um, NHS Trust, and um, she is also a massage therapist and has worked with new parents and families through sort of mental health issues and, and really supporting them. Um, Nicola Gascoigne is a counsellor. Give us a wave, Nick. Thank you. And um, she particularly focuses on um, anxiety, self-esteem, pregnancy in the postnatal period, and that transition into, period, uh, into parenthood. So all three of these ladies um, have real experience in the issues surrounding loneliness, um, parenting, and identity. Um, and hopefully we're going to get some great tips from them in what we can do to look after um, you all um, through these times. So um, yeah, thank you first of all um, ladies for taking the time out of your busy weeks to come and talk to us about this topic. I think, you know, as I said earlier, it's never been more important as we're all so far um, from the, the usual support networks and, and we can't have our friends and family just pop into our houses at the moment. So um, I'd like to kick off today's session with a question for Charlie. Um, as mentioned earlier, research shows that more than 50% of new parents feel lonely. Why do you think this is so true for new parents? Um, well, it's really, say, it's, loneliness is a really interesting topic. You know, it can be defined in different ways. So lots of people think that loneliness, particularly, it might just be by being alone. 
Um, but sometimes just being alone in itself doesn't necessarily create feelings of loneliness. Um, so really loneliness we kind of think about as a disconnect from, from others um, and not really necessarily maybe being heard or being understood or being seen. And that can actually create feelings of, of loneliness. So I think particularly for, for new parents, you know, what they're going through is a great deal of change. Mm. Um, and, you know, their feelings whilst they're trying to care for a, for a new baby might be lost and, and kind of wrapped up in almost like a, a, not necessarily a prioritization of themselves, but actually caring for, for the new baby. So when we're thinking about why loneliness occurs, it might be because they're, you know, they're not necessarily um, being seen or being heard or being understood. Um, and particularly, as I said, it's kind of when we're going through that tra change as well, that parents might not have the support networks around them, particularly at the moment. You know, lots of families live in isolation rather than like having that extended family around. You know, we move around a lot more and we don't necessarily have the networks, um, especially if it's first baby and other parents, you know, their friends might not have had babies yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Claire, would you add anything into that? As, as in the sense of loneliness and yeah. the differences of that? Um, yeah, I think disconnection is a huge factor and that can mean different things for different people, as in, you know, that, that sense of transition from, um, you know, the, of that sense of identity. I think we're going to talk about again with the, the other questions, but of um, being a sense of, uh, particularly because I do more work in pregnancy, I suppose, that in between. So um, we can feel quite uncomfortable with change and that can make us look at things in a very different way and, and how our day to day, you know, that sense of anticipation of how that might be without knowing how it is as well and I think that a lot of the what ifs can create a lot of anxiety and that's in pregnancy and becoming a new parent and also managing that with the baby that's changing um, a great deal on a daily basis as well so there's a lot of an emotional perspective of that but like you said it comes from a, a different kind of varied of social backgrounds and you know families becoming more distantly disconnected physically disconnected as well as kind of emotionally disconnected and understanding how you were parented and how your relationship in becoming a parent with yourself is and I guess Nick we'll probably talk more about that um so yeah I, I guess um and a kind of awareness and acceptance is a big thing isn't it of knowing where you're at and where you're going and how that feeling is with that sense of transition and what connections mean to you and how you can become more connected yeah yeah no I think that's really interesting actually um and um Nick would you add anything into that as well well, I mean, are, are we talking about identity now, or are we talking about why? <laughs> um, so why, why it is? Me. Yeah. So, the change to parenthood is, you know, and is an all-encompassing change, isn't it? So, there's an awful lot of um, loss, possibly. There's a lot of change in relationships that we have with our family members, certainly with our parents, with our close friends, some of whom may not be parents. There's um, that kind of a, a shift into a new group that perhaps you haven't found yet um, in terms of your connection. Yeah, so it's, it's not surprising to me actually that that statistic that you told us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think um, what you just said then is really interesting that it's, it's change across all of those areas. So at other times in your life, you might be, I don't know, moving house and, and that's one set of change. But becoming a parent, there's so much wrapped up in that because you as an individual are changing. And Claire, as you said, your expectations of that can be difficult because you don't necessarily know what to expect or you might expect what you see and read in the media, which can often be, um, you know, best foot forward and not necessarily the reality. Um, but then you're also fat changing within your couple. If you, if you have a partner, your, that relationship is changing um, and potentially there might be feelings of loneliness arising there, which I think might be quite interesting to discuss in just a second. But then, um, as you mentioned, Nick, as well, those relationships with your friends, your family, finding those new support networks, there's just so much. And it happens at a time when, I don't know how all of our mums are feeling right now, but probably pretty exhausted. And, you know, you're, you're coping with sleep deprivation, 
um, and having to look after your baby 24 hours a day, which is completely new. So learning on the job as well. Um, what do you think that, um, like, what do you think parents can be doing to help themselves, I guess, tackle this maybe in a, it, oh, actually, let's start with the expectations. Like how, how can parents tackle their expectations versus reality look at um, some of that transition period? Who are you asking first? Sorry. Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think expectations comes with uh, talking openly and honestly about realisms. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there's almost not a romanticised of parenthood, but, you know, often parents, babies are very wanted, you know, we think it's going to be wonderful and lots of feelings of love and joy, which obviously are, are fantastic. Um, and then sometimes, you know, as I say, from a health perspective, you have to talk about like realistic, you know, the lack of sleep. Um, crying and how that makes us feel and then our own sign of emotions that having a baby can, can bring with it mm. um, so actually expectations to say it's really important to be kind of honest about about and sharing other people's journeys as well you know let's create a, a communication you know a narrative about realistic expectations um, and realistic experiences that other people are having um, without in a comparison way because often I think that again the comparison between parents can bring up lots of lots of different emotions um, and loneliness uh, being one of them particularly um, because if you feel like you know oh no I can't talk or that maybe that person might not understand because their experience is completely different to mine yeah. um, so again that kind of emotional isolation almost you're thinking oh my gosh that's not my journey um, and that's not my feeling so that can create an impact the loneliness that we that you know parents might be feeling yeah absolutely and I and I think as well if if you're seeing or hearing that other people are meeting up or doing things or you know they seem to have that support network or they have people who are checking in all the time and you're not having that or you haven't found your support network quite yet as you mentioned earlier Nicola you know that can take time just mm -hmm. because there's a baby group um, and you go to it once that doesn't mean that that's the baby group that you're going to find your community in. you might have to try two or three or four or you know find an exercise group and decide none of those things are for you but you, like everybody is different so um yeah how how do you um like i guess how how do parents go about finding that community that best suits their needs within those expectations as well for nick for you nick if you want um so you know you've mentioned the groups that there are many of um i guess nowadays a lot of these groups are happening online like this that there will be classes and and groups getting together but it, it is that thing about sort of you're being kind of cast out into a whole new reality um in terms of your who you are in 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 the group ever you know so to seek out groups that are particularly you know for people who are going through the same kind of changes as you are is you know is, is the intelligent thing to do isn't it and hopefully you know if you find enough groups and try them out then you'll be able to begin to make con connections you know with the people that you meet um as you say you know everyone is different so there are so many different mums and dads around aren't there and how you deal with it is going to be you know dependent on so many factors to do with your past experience to do with what your expectations are and what you want how you want to be a mum how you want to be a dad you know what is this new journey that you're on so it's you know and in in those groups is you know we're all they're all the women and, and the men trying to find you know the answers to you know their questions like who am i now who am i as a mum you know who am i who what mums do i you know feel drawn to what kind of groups do i want to do so, you know so it's there's a whole lot of um of things available and yeah as you say it's a question of seeking and trying to find one that you feel connected in yeah and do you I think, think 
Yeah, go, sorry, go on, Claire. <laughs> no, sorry. I was just going to say, one of the exercises I do in, with, with, in the sense of planning birth and parenthood and things like that, and, and especially at the moment, and I find it really useful, so it's kind of being really aware of what your expectations are in the sense of what's in your control, what's within your sphere of control, literally drawing a circle on a piece of paper and putting those things mm. in that circle, and what are the things that are out of your control and on the outside, and then what resources have you got within you to manage the things in your control, or do actually you need to make contact with um your tribe or your friends or, or or is it a healthcare professional or is it a group or and and then just kind of you know physically being able to sometimes see in black and white what those what those things are and what they mean to you and it's a very personal thing and that could be different one day to the next day as well but um in the sense of knowing that there's, there's some things that you just you don't have any say or anything you do won't change how certain you know anybody else behaves or thinks or how you know the world is revolving in certain aspects but actually within this sphere there are certain things that you can act on or say or do or be aware of how you're thinking about it yeah i think that is so important because i think you know we we all do it and i think women especially us are especially bad at it is looking at other people and going oh my god like they're doing this or you know they're so good at that they're such they're such an amazing mum oh my gosh their their baby sleeps through the night their baby feeds like an absolute angel whatever it is we, we're very good at looking at the negatives in ourselves and the positives in other people and then creating anxiety and stress which doesn't help any of those issues in our lives whereas if we can just look inwards and say okay that's great that's what they've got going on but there'll be other things that I'm not seeing and really focus in on ourselves and as you say coming back to that living document really isn't it mm. where you're constantly looking and going okay what is in my control I guess does it come become a little bit like a mantra mm. where you, you sort of have to say it to yourself regularly yeah, yeah and it's, it's that checking in isn't it it's having a, an activity with that that things are on elastic and you know nothing no one day is going to feel exactly the same and it's not having every day is a good day or every you know it's no thing if every day is a bad day absolutely but having you know those tools and techniques that help you manage and navigate that as a journey rather than as a destination yeah no i like that and i guess also within that journey recognizing your wins yeah yeah and i think and i've noticed actually just in the way that i work on it on a daily basis you know literally physically putting down a list with a tick box you know it could be the tiniest thing of getting in the shower or getting dressed and i appreciate it, it does come back to very basic things that you need to check in with your well-being when you're a new parent especially mm -hmm. but just physically ticking off you know does release an endorphin hit in your brain and, and gives yeah. you a chemical kind of thanks you know for doing that and a sense of achievement so again just having those little things that you can actually do as an activity can be really helpful in just managing your well-being yeah and i guess it enables you then to talk about that too because i think one of the common arguments possibly you see with new parents and, and possibly less so now that you know lots of partners are now working from home and seeing what some of that load is on new mums who are looking after a baby all day um, but whereas previously if, if partners were going out to work they'd come home and be like oh my god why haven't you done this and that and the other what have you been doing all day so sometimes it can feel that you're not achieving anything so maybe having that checklist of going well actually this is what i achieved i fed the baby 20 times i you know changed 30 nappies i managed to have a shower i fed myself you know we went out for a walk and got some fresh air which is going to help the baby sleep tonight um whatever it is you can look back and and start to be more positive about what you are doing mm. on the yeah the sense of achievement yeah okay no great so um let's have a let's have a chat about identity like nicola how does i how do identity and loneliness sort of fit together i guess to start us off <laughs> yes i suppose that um identity and loneliness would be you know they would be linked because you know, your sense of yourself your identity is very often you know attached to what you do or who you are in a certain relationship you know your 
you're a, a daughter or a son, your you know, friend, a sibling, colleague, you know, when your identity changes, like with this cataclysmic event of having a baby, um, you know, you're, you're suddenly not who you used to be. And so you're kind of cast out, like I said, it's almost like you're sort of, you know, not cast out, you're, you're just becoming something else. You know, you're not only having a baby, you're becoming a mother, aren't you? And so your identity is is all is is bound up in 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 that and what do you do you know so suddenly you're you're a mother or a father um and perhaps your friends aren't you know there's quite often i think with um especially obviously with the first baby often your friends may you may be the first one in your group of friends to have a baby that that can be really tricky because you suddenly find yourself you know with very little time certainly and much less in common with the people that you've been you know close to and, and having a laugh with or you know doing things with activities you know mm. that can all go um so that from that point of view you know i think that probably first time mums whose friendship groups do not include lots of other mums um when they when they have a baby i think are probably the most vulnerable to this you know because mm -hmm. that's the social aspect of it so yeah identity changes you know and, and it, other times in our life it changes also you know when any time you, you get a new job or you go to you know, start a new course or you you know start doing something new yes um your identity on some level does change so it's not the only time that identity changes but it's certainly a massive cataclysmic one yeah yeah mm. yeah yeah mm. Claire, so i guess is that sort of um, sense of value as well in both in yourself and how you recognise what's important to you and in your world around you and also the value that you have in different relationships that you have within your life and some of those are valuable and some of those not so and that can shift and change as you become a new parent as well in the sense that you you connect with others more so in a new way than perhaps you did before and then and, and being able to kind of in a very compassionate way allow that flexibility in the sense that it doesn't mean that you'd never be as good a friend with people that you ident you know identify that connection with in a different way before pregnancy and new parenthood but but that may evolve as well you know and then allow, again coming back to that flexibility of a journey and 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 how your identity can shift and change as well as relationships and how they're they're own identity and values are different and recognizing that they all have different maps of the same territory as you do um, and so their experiences and their lives and their current relationships will also influence how they are and behave in their relationships too and then allowing in a compassionate way that to happen mm. and sometimes that kind of inner critic voice I think can be quite loud in our sense of louder probably about how we, who we are and what we do um, and how to turn up that compassionate voice that perhaps our, you know, our really good friend would say to us normally and, and just, and hearing those voices a bit more strongly perhaps than, than that inner critic and that can be very devaluing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, I don't know, um, for me, I, I know that I have moved many, many times in my life. Um, and I have found friendships, you, you find friendships for life, but you also find friendships for your moments mm -hmm. in your life. And it's okay that some friends will be there forever and you might not talk to them for six months and you go back and you pick up. Other friends you might have in your life of, I don't know, you know, a month, five months, whatever it is, a really, really short period of time and they help you get through something in that moment. And that's okay to let those friendships go and find the new ones. Um, so it is, I think, sometimes looking at your your network and thinking, well, who who's my person for the here and now? And okay, you know, my best friend doesn't have a baby so they can't understand and that's causing some friction potentially. But they're still my best friend and they'll be there when you know I've got through this difficult period which I need to actually focus on myself my own identity that own transition period and and find what I need from a different set of people which I guess we come into things like your antenatal classes or your baby groups or health professionals whoever it is um, and thinking yeah slightly differently mm -hmm. Yes, because 
it's you know like claire was saying about values you know your values are going to change your priorities change don't they so your sort of what is important what's at the top of the list what what where you know where am i going to put all my energy that changes so you know but it doesn't mean you let go of everything like as in you know certainly you know these friendships that may sort of take a knock at the time of the transition to parenthood because you know your friend doesn't have a baby like you're saying or isn't a parent um you know that doesn't mean it's forever does it it's just mm -hmm. it's it's a, a totally changing kind of um like the elastic band i like that that mm -hmm. expression you know about about um yeah changing and coming back together and you know th these are transitional phases in life that, that, that there are many of really mm. um but parenthood because of the massive responsibility that you suddenly have the ultimate responsibility for another human being um you know it, it, it's it's very it can be really overwhelming at this point you know to find yourself feeling alone and lonely yeah mm. and do you think that um new parents can feel that within their own family unit so between the mum partner and baby suddenly there's a baby coming in into that relationship and like certainly i think that each of those people will feel that quite differently so yeah. well yeah, Charlie, sorry, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, I think Claire made a really good point, is that you're um, learning your new identity, how that fits with your old identity, how they all mesh together. Um, and then, you know, the partner also learning that, you know, their identity, who they are, their role within that, how you then identify as a couple um, and, and, and then as a family unit. And then you have all of your other friends in your family mm -hmm. sitting on and trying to learn also your new identity. <laughs> so it's a, a real mix of emotions and it, like, um, you know, both Claire and Nicholas said it's about fluidity, you know, mm -hmm. kind, being kind to yourself. You're not going to know your new identity right away and you don't know your baby's identity right away. And it's kind of being kind to ourselves in that transition of actually it takes time. You know, we're not going to know our new identity straight away and we're not going to know our partner's identity straight away. Um, and it's really about communicating those kind of things. Well, I'm feeling a bit lost because I've learned this new identity and I don't know if I can be both. Can I be myself and a mum or a dad at the same time? Um, and of course we can. It's just trying to work out what exactly that means to us as an individual and then to us as a couple and then to us as a family and then to us as a wider network. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's just about say, kind of learning as through the process and that definitely doesn't happen straight away. Um, but communication, I always think, is a number one uh, huge thing that can, can really aid that transition and actually ease feelings of loneliness you know because mm -hmm. say um if we're more in the new identity and less feeling like our old identity but we're still um married or in a partnership with somebody how do we work that out yeah. you know and and, yeah. and it's almost like you're married or in a partnership with potentially somebody new and you've never seen this side of somebody yeah. it's a brand new person um in terms of their new identity so and um, for the baby as well yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. You know, they all come with their own personalities and that takes time to learn and communicate and, and establish. Mm, that is so true. And I think, I think that is something that maybe we don't think about enough before becoming a parent, because you think about wanting to be, you know, wanting to have a baby. But I wonder how often you think about what personality your child is going to have and recognise that that personality is going to be there from birth literally I mean it's it's already developing inside of you with that personality they're born with that personality and you know you for throw in the other elements like if a baby is not a sleeper or if a baby likes to cry a little bit more than other babies or likes to feed more or you know whatever those things are that add layers of complexity to you trying to figure out who you are as a mother who you are as a father who you know your baby is who you are as a couple um you know i guess you have to start by communicating with yourself don't you mm. and then when you understand what you're feeling communicating with the other people in your lives mm -hmm. um which you know even communicating with yourself can be really mm -hmm. hard indeed indeed it can yeah i was going to say you know that once you start to sort of 
you know so you here you are you know nothing you know, start from knowing nothing and that's okay is it okay to not know all of this stuff, you know exactly like, and to, to, yeah, yeah to, to be able to sit with the feeling that everything is very foggy at the moment mm. in that sense and, it, and that fogginess does bring you to a point where you can you know your focus is much closer just as a baby's eyesight is you know this much distant the same it feels in that family and that's why those first few weeks it's so important to have that time to have you to you know allow that fog to sit to bring you all into that time to get to know each other and explore all of these things and that gradually as that fog, that fog lifts that you know that your kind of circle can widen and you know you can gradually feel a bit more comfortable with that and the and the wider outdoors you know whether that's kind of emotionally or, or psychologically or physically or socially you know or, and that, that, that each all of this takes one step at a time it's it's not an instant thing it's a moving I keep on back to this journey thing but yeah it's um but having a, a sense of, of allowance that that's okay to feel that foggy yeah so with that in mind is lockdown helping new families mm. because they're forced into or forced for want of a better phrase into having that time to really focus on themselves and their family unit without that interruption from their wider support networks do you think that's one of the benefits that we'll see like whilst i think it's very easy to focus on lots of the negatives of lockdown do you think that's one of the yeah. benefits that we'll see i think um anecdotally i'm hearing you know from other midwives that work in the community yeah. babies are getting much back to their birth weights much quicker um yeah. even at five days for some and that doesn't mean that's right or wrong it, it, there yeah. isn't an, you know an, an acceptance that your baby has to be back at their birth weight that quickly but that having that kind of intensity of time in getting to know each other you know for skin to skin for feeding um that that's being really helpful for families having allowance that actually in my postnatal plan i would have really liked it if i just had this one person who really helps me and that those people weren't quite so helpful but i you know in normal circumstances it's difficult to say that isn't it it's difficult to put a plan or a note on your door saying please can only marge come from next door because she's lovely and feeds me nice casseroles whereas <laughs> you know my mother-in-law is a nightmare and, and not really that helpful at the moment yeah. but, but this you know kind of does give you that time and space to to really you know have that kind of focus time but it, again it's about your individual experiences and how you're feeling emotionally and who yeah. do you need to be you know talking about a fog but actually sometimes you do need to put your fog light on don't you it can feel like a bit of a struggle and how can you reach out if it is feeling too difficult and you're struggling day to day from a mental health perspective yeah. um so yeah it's yeah. interesting i think there's always a really a discomfort in this in a change especially if it's a change that's enforced by somebody else yeah. But even if it is your choice of being in that in between an A and a B can feel really uncomfortable and how can you sit with that and how can you manage that, yeah. in, you know, in getting, in getting to that place. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's it. And one of the one of the I was gonna say I say anecdotally, like I've been supporting lots of parents and it kinda of goes two ways. So it's real benefits, absolutely feeding babies back up to birth weight, real bonding, but not just with, with mums who predominantly stay at home, but also dads, you know, dads may be furloughed, they're working from home. So mm. actually they're feeling much stronger bonds um with baby. Um, especially for the families that have noticed quite a significant difference. This might be their second baby. And they noticed like quite a difference. Um, so that's like a real mm -hmm. positive, say like a real positive, you're kind of having these moments of quieter moments where you are just really bonding, you're kind of getting to know baby and their personality mm -hmm. without lots and lots of distractions. Yeah. But on the other flip side of maybe feeling a bit lonely because you don't have that extra support. Um, and if you are struggling, maybe um, there's been some, you know, difficulty accessing healthcare. Um, if you're having any kind of feeding issues or anything like that, um, so some, yeah, maybe it's just a feeling of isolation where you're not seeing people, but you can still access them, but you're not having that maybe personal contact with them. So I think it's a double-edged sword, really. Like, say, yeah. lots of positives, um, whilst also <laughs> some some real hindrances. But I completely agree with the ladies. It's one of those things that it's almost like. Um, please leave your judgments at the door, you know, I'm going to leave, I'm going to do it my way. And actually uh, one of the, the benefits of lockdown is you are having less people be like, you should do this and you should do this. And really parents should just find their own way <laughs> to do things yeah. um, in the safest possible way, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, I want to pick um, one of the, like, there was loads of stuff in that, but I want to pick one thing out, which is the, 
um, partners, you know, dads, partners being at home um, during this really intense time, even if they are back at work, and them getting to know the babies because mums can call them if they need something or, you know, potentially see the first smiles, giggles, whatever it is. So do you think that looking at that family unit and thinking about loneliness, you know, for the partners, potentially those trigger points where they're the ones feeling left out of the family unit, because often that's, that's where they end up, isn't it? The mum is feeding the baby, the baby wants mum because she's primary caregiver, so the baby comes to the mum more easily, potentially. Is that something that partners and fathers are, are maybe having a benefit and maybe some of that loneliness within that family unit is being broken down um, as they get to spend more time potentially with these with their partners and babies absolutely i mean anecdotally um so you know one of the mums i'm supporting is suffering um quite significantly with her mental health and actually dad just being at home he's being furloughed it's it's huge it's, it's really huge and you know they are they, they i saw them yesterday they report being a real unit you know, a, a real strength there so that when, you know, each one of them are struggling, um, then they can pass to the other to the other person and, re and really tag team it in. I think it's um, a real eye opener for um, parental leave. You know, I really do think mm. that there needs to be a big push in legislation to get paternity leave increased. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also important on the side of that to acknowledge that actually a lot of a lot of um, partners aren't all furloughed and that they're trying to work from home or yeah. they're, try they're having to go into work. They might work in, in a healthcare environment and there's the challenges of that in, in a pandemic. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's, actually it's to acknowledge actually there's a lot of mixed stories and not everybody is yeah. in that kind of what might be conceived as a, a parenting ideal at yeah. the beginning. There's the additional challenges of perhaps not even feeling like they're doing either very well at the moment. Yeah. You know, they're trying to be a new parent, but there's an expectation that they're trying to work in the same physical environment and how challenging that is and, and how to navigate that is really important in the sense. Yeah, you still really feel, important. More isolated from work. So not that physically isolated from your partner and baby because you're trying to work and then yeah you, um, Absolutely. and i think you manage that in a day and you are seeing people like certainly a lot of the people i speak to are working from home um but finding that they're working harder longer hours doing more than potentially they would have done if they were going into their offices or as you say the partners um or families are split up where um, you have people in frontline services who are more at risk of um, catching COVID. Um, so you are seeing families completely split during this time, which adds even more loneliness into the mix and makes it that journey that much harder. So it's yeah. challenging, it is, absolutely. Yeah, and it comes back to the fact that everybody's different and we have to plan for ourselves rather than looking at other people's situations doesn't it and, and social media is, is a big aspect of that isn't it in the sense of connection of, of there being lots of really valuable support there but being able to manage that of, of not you know becoming fixated with it which can be very easy to do of accessing the right quality of information um just online generally um yeah, it, it's a minefield, isn't it? It's difficult. It's no wonder it can feel overwhelming sometimes. But sometimes just breaking it down into those little different aspects so that you can manage one thing at a time and maintain those levels of communication to the people that you know that are really valuable to you is more important than ever. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, what what are the, some of the practical if we were doing a checklist of how to look after yourself through this period of change in your identity as a woman as a, a man as a mother as a father you know as a partner like what what do you think some of those practical steps are so if we were to walk away from today's session with some things that everybody here today can can take away to do or to just start to think about what what do you think where do where do we start with that 
Nick, maybe. Um, oh, no. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, sorry <you> know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Claire. Then kickstart us, and then we'll come. Well, I think I think just the, the very first step sometimes can just be that sense of awareness of just noticing your emotions, even of just naming them, naming what they are, naming them twice, um, and then having some kind of breathing or grounding technique that can just help you manage in that very moment. So very simple, um, but I think it can be helpful. Sometimes, you know, it can be easy to try and repress fear or anger or, you know, lots of other negative emotions, but actually if you let them be what they are, and sometimes they can be really useful and appropriate and acknowledge what it is, name it what it is. Is this quite actually quite useful at this time? Or do I need to change my environment and go outside? Do I need to take some deep breaths? Do I need to, um, you know, look around me and just notice what's going on? Um, that can just be a really simple starting point, I think. That's, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Nick, what would you add to that as maybe? Um, I would say, you know, the, 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 the issue of sort of comparison of ourselves as, as mothers um, or fathers, but mostly mothers, I think, actually, um, that if you can find a way to just be present with what you feel, what you want, how you are, you know, in this moment, rather than, you know, thinking that you should be doing something else or that you're not doing it right or someone else is doing it better and all of that. If you can, you know, notice when you're getting into that kind of thinking with yourself and, you know, understand that, that it's normal to feel, you know, anxious about who you are and what, what you're doing as a parent when something so important is happening, such a big phase is, is you know, kicking off. You know, if you can and just know that, you know, in each moment you do the best that you can. And if you can stay present with yourself in that and just try to put those feelings of, of self-comparison aside, you know, to say, well, I understand why I would be feeling like that. But it's not appropriate. Everybody is different. All mothers and um, find their own way with their with their each individual baby. And, you know, even, you know, the difference between this first baby, the second baby, you know, it's always going to be completely different. So the, the longer you go on, you realize that there is no comparison. There is nothing to compare. You know, your experience is nothing like anybody else's really, you know, even yeah. though we can talk in general terms about things. So if you can sort of, yeah, watch yourself for that. I think yeah. it's really important. Try and stay present with yourself and your baby. Mm. And I, and I think maybe, adding within that discussing with your partner so your immediate family unit whatever that looks like and making sure you're on the same page so presenting that wider that united front to your wider support network because mm. <coughs> i think if you've got all of that going on in your head and your partner has something different going on in their head and you're trying to parent without communicating about those things and mm. other people's opinions and mm. so on are coming in that That's can cause friction. A sense of walking side by side isn't it <coughs> yeah. yeah 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 which does take work and constant checking mm. in like you say the more that you can check in about how you're feeling it starts by yeah. checking in with yourself about how am i feeling you know mm. and if you can communicate that with your partner it really opens up the 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 communication the more that you do it the more it can yeah. happen and, and it encourage you encourage, encourage each other to to come forward with with how you are feeling so that you can support each other and and, and be aware of what's going on for each other but mm. absolutely and i've written down acceptance as well mm. um so awareness and acceptance mm -hmm. you know awareness to the emotion but accepting that that is the emotion you're feeling there's no good absolutely. or bad emotions um, there is just emotion and then accepting that that's how you're feeling or how your partner is feeling at that time. You know, there should be, you shouldn't necessarily feel a certain way. You just, uh, the feeling just is. Um, mm. And then also acceptance of baby and their personality. Um, so kind of when we think, oh gosh, I wish you wouldn't cry so much. Or, oh gosh, I wish you would sleep it better. You know, those feelings, again, and those thoughts are very normal, but accepting that, that we've had them and then accepting it for what, for what baby is. You know, maybe they're not a great sleeper and that's okay for right now. And maybe in the future we can look at how to improve that situation a bit. But just accepting the day or the situation or the feeling or the emotion um, for, for what it is at, at that time. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. yeah, I was going to add to that. It's a, another one of coming back to the here and now, like, the, you know, can be, especially at the moment, this whole sense of overwhelm with lots of different things feeling very heavy. 
um, and the all and what ifs that can be in your mind. Coming back to the here and now and feeling safe is, is such a crucial thing. And that has a real physical um, trigger on your body in the sense it calms down the parasympathetic system. So by taking a deep belly breath and a long out breath, Mm. you're actually triggering an endorphin and a dopamine or serotonin response depending on on how things are working but it helps to slow everything down so it slows down your heart rate and it slows down your uh, breathing rate and it helps you to give a sense of control and, and you know and it might be you work better with an affirmation of some kind of, that you need a phrase that you repeat to yourself or it might be that you literally take your shoes off and put your feet on the ground or it might be that you use like a five four three two one technique of just either with all your senses or different shapes and you literally just visually connect with what's around you and again that just gives your mind and body a chance to catch up with each other and then you're at a better place to kind of rethink again you know what would be appropriate for me right now but that that safety is really important that's it. I think Ken makes a really good point about the connectedness. You know, when you're connected to yourself and, and potentially to your physical environment, then feelings of loneliness, which is the disconnect, um, can actually reduce. And when we're talking, you know, to a partner about how they're feeling and accepting that, again, that's, you know, allowing a person to, to feel heard and to feel seen and again, accepted, which creates a connectedness rather than the disconnect, um, which again, the lone, feelings of loneliness can, mm. can really bring prominence. Yeah, that's right. Because actually, loneliness isn't about, being, you know, not having people around you, because you can have a room full of people, your loved ones, your friends, your family, and be the most lonely person in the world. So that does come back to that connection and connecting with yourself, your emotions, your feelings, all of the things that we've discussed today. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, great. Um, before we start taking any questions, do you guys have anything that you think we haven't discussed and we should have done um, or anything to add? I was just going to add that one thing I found really useful from a work perspective, but also my own personal well-being is that, and, I, and I've not been as good at it as I should be, but in a practical sense, like when you do speak to somebody on the phone or Zoom or you, you, know, you meet for a walk or whatever, is to arrange to meet them again at a time and place. So it can be um, really difficult, I think, sometimes, and you can get quite awash with the day-to-day -day and not make, you know, an arrangement for that connection that can get harder to do. But sometimes just by arranging that, you know, when you're with somebody can help you maintain that connection moving forward. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it always works and, you know, and, but sometimes having that connection already there rather than trying to arrange it or being able to cancel it and rearrange it is easier than to make that connection if you're feeling like you're struggling or, you know, finding things difficult but it's just a kind of practical thing I think. I can't think of anything else yeah no that that makes real sense actually because I think like I, I know certainly it can become quite stressful I've got lots of friends who they're always like oh yeah ping me a date when you're free and you're like oh you know it if the pressure is always put on you to be going out and making those connections and you've got tons of other stuff going on in your life and you're feeling stressed and you're feeling like you can't that's just one more thing that you can't do actually yeah in that moment saying oh we've had a great zoom call why don't we do this next friday or mm. okay let's do this in a month's time let's go like there's something going on in town let's go and check it out as you say it's completely fine on that day or you know leading up to it to rearrange but it's easier to rearrange than to start something completely new yeah, yeah. um nick anything to add um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking about control and this sense of loss of control that, that might come over new parents as in, you know, you've started this ball rolling, you've made a baby, you've had a baby and now, you know, it's all, it is kind of out of your control, isn't it? Once you start the ball rolling. So loss of control can be really hard, um, for people who, you know, who maybe already struggle with anxiety or, you know, have issues that, that, that makes it very feel very dangerous to sort of be out of control so if you can sort of you know if maybe that's true for you um, maybe it is worth um, talking about that with with somebody but also to acknowledge with yourself that this is what I'm feeling I feel out of control and knowing that that actually is kind of normal this kind of you are on the coaster there's you know you can't there's no going back now and all of that um, that, that you are kind of you know you're in a process and, and you are being carried along in a certain way by it you know that it's not something you can exactly 
you know, you can't sort of know what, what was going to happen next, essentially, a lot of the time. And you're kind of getting used to that feeling of being a parent or, you know, about how you, you know, you can't have control of everything. Um, so if you can acknowledge that with yourself and be compassionate with that and understand it, you know, just take, take a moment to sort of, to be with that feeling, acknowledge it and, and let it be, you know, yeah. I would say that. Charlie, anything else to add? No, I think just say if, if you are recognising that you are feeling a bit a bit lonely, um, then absolutely trying to reach out um, to say to partner to, to somebody else to try and get like Claire said, something booked in the diary to to be experiencing that all of those kind of things because. I think um, when you recognize that potentially you're feeling lonely and then if you feel like there's nothing that can be done that can kind of almost impact that like oh gosh I really am alone or feeling lonely so it's almost like when you recognize that feeling to be like okay let's look at the positives what can I do about this who can I talk to who can I reach out to who's around me um, mm. to, to, to make this a little a little bit better mm. and actually um, I realized that there was one thing I wanted to ask um, Thinking about that now and that, you know, for the new pe people having their babies now during the pandemic, the usual baby groups can't meet in person because to socially distant distance in small rooms is just not possible. Um, so a lot of stuff is happening online. Do you think that you can build meaningful relationships on platforms like Zoom, like Facebook. Can you, you know, because I, th I think some of the baby groups are very much sort of about a baby activity, um, which it's easier when you're in person to be having a laugh with the mum or the dad next to you doing some sort of dance or song with your child than it is if you're each in your individual living rooms doing that over Zoom. So, what like yeah can you have meaningful relationships on these sorts of platforms can you build those friendships and are they a safe space to discuss potentially personal things in the same way that you might have that discussion with a mum or a dad or somebody in your network more easily if you knew it was just you two and I throw it out to the parents as well I don't know because I think you know this is something like we obviously now run all of our classes on zoom we've created as much um, extra social time as we can but I recognize that and we recognize by speaking seeing the you know in the whatsapp groups we're starting to see people meet up socially in in small groups and even with all of the additional um, Zoom social stuff, it is not the same for them. So if social distancing is going to continue, if we you know, face second waves and all of this kind of stuff, life is going to be different for a little while. Can we, can we build those relationships? I, I definitely think that um, solid relationships mm. can be built over, over social networking platforms, over groups, you know, over things like Zoom. And I think it's really about feelings of safety. So people feel safe that they can share, that they don't feel judged. Yeah. Um, and so I think if you're leading, you know, an online platform or a Zoom or those kind of things, it's really important that people that you kind of establish that actually on this environment, we're really accepting, you know, no question is too silly. We are um, really compassionate towards each other. We're really kind. We listen to each other. So I think, you know, absolutely those connections can 100% be built but it, it's built on trust and, and safety uh, and compassion and all of those kind of things that you would be looking to do in a group setting anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just establishing that, uh, you know, acceptance over, um, over the social platform or the, the media platform um, that hopefully creates an environment that people feel that they can share and be connected with one, with one another and be open about to how they're feeling. Yeah. And that connections are, are like a jigsaw, aren't they? There's not just, you know, one way to connect with people. And for some people, that's not, you know, it's a difficult thing getting used to Zoom. And I think that's really understandable. And for others, you can kind of roll into it. 
um, much more easily. And it can be a, a sense of, okay, I'm going to feel uncomfortable with it for a little while, but we're going to give it a go. And actually afterwards I can notice that I, you know, I feel a bit fuzzier because I've connected with somebody I didn't expect to. Um, but, but knowing that it's, this is, you know, we're not always going to be in this situation, but this is a new way of being for all of us that hopefully can facilitate a better way to be connected with people that are physically further away. You know, so, you know, feeling yeah. like people are in the room with you, even though they're, they're cities and countries away, you know, is a really valuable thing. So it's, it's just having a sense of inquiry and exploration, I think, and knowing that actually some, with some people Zooming can be, you know, it can be really difficult with Zoom about it, of understanding new guidelines and new manners that come yeah. with that. But we will get used to it and then find new ways of being with it, really. And I guess, actually rocking up to a baby group for the first time or an exercise class or the park on your own and looking at all the other mothers or fathers sitting in the park on their own and thinking oh god I really want to talk to somebody but I don't want to go up to them and then be rejected because they're like oh I've got friends I don't want to talk to you which nine times out of ten would never happen because every other mm. mother probably sat there at that time or father potentially is thinking, oh, I wish somebody would come up and say hello to me because I'm too shy to go up to them. So that feeling of awkwardness on Zoom is probably a very similar feeling to how we'd have in the real world. Mm. But it's a bit harder to sit in a breakout room or on a Zoom call and just not talk. So maybe sometimes you're forced to talk. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, this is, the, this is the biggest group I've ever kind of Zoomed with. Um, I work one-to-one -one and so I've actually found, and my clients also report, um, that, they're, that you know, it can, we can reach great sen a great sense of being connected and able to feel intimate um, and like you can talk about things that, that are difficult or that really matter. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I haven't had much experience with the big group and I, and I must say that... Um, it's it's novel because there's a lot of people I can't see them either. Yeah, the um, cameras are switched which off. Which is fine. But <laughs> it's fine. I can understand why you do that. Um, We've got eighteen people on the call at the moment. Yeah, that's right. It's lovely. Yeah, it's great. yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting thing. It's certainly been easier than I thought it would be to to feel connected with people I work with um, online, and it really is going better than I thought. Yeah, even yeah. even new clients who have never met in person at all. That's that's, yeah. that's been a completely new experience. Yeah, and I guess for some, you know, there's always that thing of getting a baby out of a house can be hard. So maybe Zoom opens up mm. a way of socializing for mums who are having a tricky day if they're you know if it's a day feeding a baby on a sofa or mm. the baby's feeling particularly fussy and you're just like oh, I just can't go and sit in a cafe because I'll feel really anxious and and so on so maybe what we will see going forward is a real mix of services both in person and online to support new parents at whatever stage they're they are at in that journey or you know on that particular day and maybe that's, uh, yeah. maybe that's a better thing i don't know 100 percent. i mean you make a really good point so lots of in you know postnatal groups there are lots and lots of anxieties and worries about what if baby cries yeah what if baby cries and i can't soothe them how will that reflect on me yeah. um and you know some babies do just cry and you can soothe them and soothe them and soothe them but they're just not having a good day um and <laughs> So running postnatal groups is, you know, I say really difficult when you say it's okay, babies cry in this group, we are accepting that babies cry and that's okay. Um, but I guess with the Zoom, you can just unmute, you know, mute yourself, um, go off, take, so that you feel like actually maybe that's better. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah. have your 18 people maybe looking or thinking, ah, that's you know, making me feel a little bit Stressful. insecure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And it takes a little more effort to sort of join and unjoin. Like you don't have to get a baby into a car and drive across to wherever or <laughs> a bus or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah. No, fantastic. So I do have a question in our, um, in our chat, which has come to me. Mm. So um, I really struggle to know how to arrange meetups and tend to miss the boat. What's a good approach to arranging meetups with people? 
you went you cut out a little bit there Iona. Oh, sorry. sorry i only got half the um, question so it says i struggle to arrange no, I, I struggle to know how to arrange meetups and tend to miss the boat what's a good way to approach um arranging a meetup so i guess it would be whether it's in person or online yeah i guess anyway it, it, yeah yeah, so, so in terms of like, I guess, arranging a meetup, I mean, at the moment, if the weather's good, you know, we park or open spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's having, you know, Nicola or Claire jumping in, if it's a confidence thing sometimes. We're thinking, oh my gosh, like, do I want to meet up? Or, you know, and it, it, lots of insecurities to meeting new people can, can, can really come. And again, acknowledging those, we're thinking, okay, you know, I, I really want to do this. How can I do it? And I think, um, you know, if potentially the meetup hasn't worked out, not taking that on as a reflection of your of yourself, but of the circumstance of someone else's situation, because sometimes you know arranging a meetup comes with fear because we think, what if they don't want to? What if they can't make it? You're really putting yourself out there in terms of potentially having a rejection, but not taking that rejection as a self reflection, but as a situational thing um, that that potentially say that life is busy, maybe they can't make it, you know, and it's, it's not to do with you personally, but just as a, as a situation and, and congratulate yourself for, for wanting to meet up and putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And exploring different avenues, you know, to different people like saying for connecting different ways. So it might be a text, it might be a WhatsApp group, it might be a Facebook message, it, you know, that, that any avenue is, is okay if it's a way of connecting and everybody might have a different one that they might use. But it seems like, you know, WhatsApp's quite a good way of connecting a bigger group. Yeah. Um, and I guess yeah. when you start, you might start on a WhatsApp group for a particular topic around being a mum and you might be chatting and, or, you know, a, a Facebook group or whatever it is, you might be chatting about a wider topic and then, to throw something out and say, oh, I was thinking of going to the park on Saturday. Does anybody fancy it? Mm. It's mm. quite a soft approach, isn't it? So that if you, you know, there's bound to be somebody who will, in a larger group, who will say, oh, yeah, that's great. I was thinking of going to the park too. Maybe um, we could meet at a particular time or whatever. But also it's not as personal as asking a specific person if they want to do something on a specific date so that fear of rejection is potentially lower i don't know yeah absolutely i think this person as well mentioned about missing the boat and there's mm. always more opportunity you know absolutely in terms of you know it's not necessarily a one-time thing you know we can continue to to try and connect and to try and meet people and and there's i wouldn't say like a there's m multiple boats coming yeah so don't feel like you missed the first one yeah. there's not going to be more boats on the way yeah and i think people are quite desperate to get out and meet other mums and things so if you're on a i don't know a zoom baby sensory class or something to ask the teacher you know to say does anybody in the group want to meet up would you like me to help facilitate that um it's something that we're starting to do with our classes you know putting well, we had, um, I think, 17 couples in our la latest Bishopston group and trying to organise meetings of six <laughs> out of 17 couples is, uh, it took a while. <laughs> but, you know, putting little groups together um, out of a bigger group, if those people want to do that. Um, and actually on that note, if people do want that, then, you know, let me know privately and I will be very happy to um, do that. Absolutely, and same way talking to health professionals as well. You know, as health officers, um, we work quite closely with people with social isolation. Um, and so again, it's thinking about if you did want to meet other people, um, you know, asking if the health professional, you know, has met other people else that might connect with. And, um, you know, in terms of confidentiality, if you're willing to share your details, um, then that can also be a good way, you, like say, using other people to meet people. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, so um, I'm going to open up to everybody who's on the call. If you do have any questions, um, do you want to wave at me, type them in, unmute yourself? Are there any questions at all? That's very sharp. Emma, are you about to ask a question? Yes. I'll ask a question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I found it quite. I'm quite a kind of physical 
person, I suppose, like I love a hug. Um, I'm sure we're all kind of probably missing that right now. Um, But yeah, I suppose, you know, we've all had to adjust to kind of the virtual world and using Zoom. Um, But what kind of else can you do potentially um, to kind of support that side if you are, if your personality is that you kind of really need that kind of physical interaction I suppose and that body language in the moment um yeah um, I'm at the moment I haven't had my baby I'm overdue a few days um so yeah I suppose do you have any tips I mean obviously I've got a lovely partner Steve (laughs) and husband so are you velcroed together presently (laughs) (laughs) like um yeah uh yeah so what 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 other things would you suggest I suppose I think um, it can be a really nice approach, even with your partner, of just really leaning into a hug. Nicola Gascon taught me to freeze leaning in. <laughs> but, um, but of really going, you know, really being as a mindfulness kind of how it's feeling, how, you know, how things are seeing, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, you know, and really connecting in a sort of long, deep way and making it as long a touch as possible. We know that if you can hug for sort of 30 seconds to a minute, you get a much you know, really positive physical reaction to that. But then also self-massage can be really helpful and especially connecting to your baby. Um, so it can be just a really simple way when you're feeling your baby move, putting your hands on your belly. And again, just having that very kind of gentle tuning in of kind of which bits are you feeling? Can you kind of respond back and give them a little bit of a massage? What position do you think they're in? Um, what's my skin feeling like? Do you want to put oils on your skin? And kind of really tuning in and just making that a real meaningful kind of experience as well. And that gives you a similar sort of response physiologically as having a really good hug does. And the great thing about that is that your baby gets the flood of all those hormones as well. And it can be whether your baby's inside or outside, you can connect in the same way with them. So that yeah. can be a really nice way. Or just, you know, massage techniques. There's a really nice relaxation point on the inside of your palm. So if you put the a kind of, not the middle finger, but the next one in between your middle and your little finger, that point there, you can just press it. Um, so you can just press and hold, or you can um, do it press as you breathe in and release as you breathe out. And again, just being kind of connected in that way can be. And that's a really lovely pressure point for babies and toddlers as well. If they're feeling quite frantic. Um, or kind of yeah getting completely overwhelmed emotionally having a tantrum those kind of things so these points you don't necessarily have you can just grab their palms and just do it with a kind of focus touch Um, but that can be a really nice way just to kind of just connect you know body wise as well and for you getting ready for birth as well you know just (laughs) those few deep breaths that's those self-massage techniques will flood yourself with oxytocin which you need for birth however you're choosing to have your baby and when your baby's here as well and hopefully Steve is giving you lots of massage right now, Emma, as well. Yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> he wow. Right. Rub here and there and back rub and yeah, definitely. Nice. He's just shouting. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know, you, you can give him massage too. And that's just as good for you and for him. And then he'll get to know how it feels. And so he'll be able to give you an even better massage because you'll yeah. be able to guide him. Yeah, yeah, we've got a nice concoction of some Fab. oils and yeah, coconut oil and stuff. So good. great. Thank you oh, very much. Good luck with everything. <laughs> so we do have another question. Um, what professional help or mental health support is available at the moment whilst lockdown continues, and what's the best way of seeking that? So that your first connection can be your midwife or your health visitor, depending at what stage you're at. But we're really lucky in Bristol that we have a lot of resources from um, avenues like Bluebell and Mothers for Mothers, um, who also have dads groups as well. And they're doing a lot of um, a lot of their sort of groups that they run longer term, like Bluebell's Comfort Zone group, for example, is now running by Zoom. Um, and having one-to-one support they're still doing their buddying by telephone and with video contact and face-to-face where they can and um, navigate that might be going for a walk or um, different things like that so um, that's a really important aspect and then online really you know noticing a lot of uh, people that do offer kind of antenatal and postnatal kind of education groups and things like that 
are doing more you know that you can access from a national perspective it could be a really good group in Kent or, for example so it's just exploring social media can be really helpful um, with a kind of inquiry and caution but, but finding you know what works for you and I think getting in contact with group facilitators directly to make sure that you know they're the right group for you um, can be really helpful and you know they should be able to offer you a kind of one-to-one -one warm up session or a meeting session to be able to do that before you're kind of introduced to a different group or a different support network um, but yeah certainly Bristol Bluebell and Mothers for Mothers are a really good point of contact and Bluebell you know offer support two years postnatally as do Mothers for Mothers or even up to school age so um, so yeah and it's still active still accessing GPs as well although they're not necessarily might not see you face to face you know phone consultations with GPs so they can make referrals um, yeah. it's feeling like really bad for you know perinatal mental health teams um, yeah and the crisis and team is, is always there 24 hours a day which you can just google um, and they're important 24 7 contact that your you can call yourself or your friends and family can call and they um, if it's you know very urgent you're really struggling with um, feelings of self-harm or suicidal ideations they would they would be with you with either within four hours or 36 depending on what your needs are um, so they're really important to know about mm -hmm. great thank you um, any other questions, anyone? I appreciate lots of people are on, uh, have their videos turned off, but you can type questions to me if you would like to. Oh, we've got one here. Um, okay, yeah, this is a good question. Um, do you have any advice on how mums can start to explore what their new identity is? Nick, maybe starting with you. And uh, no, yeah, we'll start with that one and then I'll ask the second one. It's a work in progress, isn't it, identity? I mean, I think the first thing is to really acknowledge with yourself that your, your identity has changed and, and sit with that for a minute, you know. Um, you know, connecting with other people in order that you can feel that you haven't like been cast adrift entirely on your own. So staying connected with the people around you. But it's something that kind of develops, isn't it? You know, what, what do you feel drawn to? What, what kind of group do you want to attend? You know, what kinds of mums, what, what, what kind of people do you feel drawn to in this, in this time in terms, of, um, in terms of, you know, just finding out this stuff? It's not something that is known, I think, is the answer to that. That, that it is, you know, it's a question of staying present with yourself in the moment and not feeling like you should be doing something else or you ought to have decided what your identity is by now or anything like that but to acknowledge that it's an ongoing process and a, um, you know something that can't be hurried really I don't know if that's very helpful to take yeah. a question of how, how to start to, to yeah. find your identity hmm. do you even you know, have to take a step back from that and think about your identity before you become a mother so who are you as an individual on your own and then you know what did you love before you got pregnant you know what were the yeah, yeah. people that you loved what yeah. were the people that you found made you feel anxious you know thinking about some of those things or the situations yeah. that made you feel anxious absolutely i think yeah, i mean highlight... the... oh, sorry nick go ahead no you carry on no it's all right you go I was just going to say, it's about self-awareness, I think, isn't it? So being like, oh, I did not like that. Oh, I liked that. <laughs> um, and just the same, that kind of self-awareness of how we're feeling in that moment. Oh, that made me feel a bit uncomfortable. Maybe that's not the way I want. But also not trying to, I think, as parents, sometimes you know, there's so many different parenting approach. We try and attach ourselves to a particular approach. I'm going to be, um, you know, this kind of parent, or I'm going to be this kind of parent. And sometimes actually in that journey of the, trying to find our identity, we actually think, oh that doesn't work for me that doesn't fit that didn't feel comfortable I didn't really enjoy that or maybe I should do it so a complete fluidity of just self-awareness of really tuning into how you felt at that time and what you're comfortable with and and um say a real self-reflection and, and, mm. and awareness journey and in that sense sometimes you know exploring that you might connect with that in a different way so writing something down putting a big piece of paper on the wall and drawing a picture and then you know 
um, or doing it literally in drawer or drawing or picture form or putting together photographs, you know, like a sense of, um, there's lots of maternal journal, for example, is a really lovely way that you can connect online in a, and connect in a visual and creative way of exploring how you're feeling and how you're becoming and how you're being and, and how, you know, you tend to be at this moment of time. So it's um, just, it, yeah, finding what you resonate with and, and different ways of exploring that yourself. Mm -hmm. And I guess being really honest with yourself as well, isn't it? So if there is a person or a situation that gives you energy, that, you know, trying to connect with that person or people connected to that person, you know, exploring that avenue more. But then if there's a person or a, a group or anything that gives, gives you that, like, oh, actually, I wasn't quite sure about that, or they didn't, they didn't bring they didn't give me energy they I felt anxious or whatever it is being honest with yourself and having the strength to step away from some of those relationships or situations and I think it comes back to that being flexible and recognizing re that you have relationships for times in your lives and and I think all of our values you know our values can adapt and change um, as we grow as people and recognizing that you you know, that impacts um, things that you want to do or who you are and or who you want to hang out with. And that's okay. And being honest about that. And it doesn't necessarily involve a massive conversation with somebody. It can just involve a general, a gentle distancing, can't it? Mm -hmm. you know? So you don't have to always have that confrontation. Yeah. Anything else in that one, guys? Well, I think that's yeah, it. I think, I think just accepting again I, I know I keep coming back to that one but you know again um accepting the, the new identity that maybe the, the new identity doesn't love coffee and the old you loved coffee you know and and just accepting those that, that almost like a grief thing where we kind of go oh well, that wasn't me I'm not that but accepting that actually maybe that this new identity comes with things that previously we loved and, and now we don't and that's okay too yeah yeah there's always tea absolutely um we have another question um do you have much experience on how loneliness affects dads hmm. open to anyone in lots of, dad, lots of different ways isn't it yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the That's same it. way in the same exactly way. that yeah, it's in the same way. I'd say the, I think the challenge is probably the same, you know, identity, acceptance, um, finding community, communication, all of those kind of things. And I, I it's with dads often um, they do report loneliness because maybe the, the communication within dads groups um, needs uh, facilitating a bit more. And, and also, I think just access, you know, dads groups hopefully are in on the increase um, historically they have been um, kind of few and far between, but I know there's a big shift in terms of dads connecting and dads mm -hmm. groups and, and lots more conversation around um, paternal mental health and how services can support mm -hmm. those feelings of loneliness in, in that situation too. There's a lot more popping up online, I think. Um, there's a midwife called Mark Harris, who does a lot of um, dad support, and he has Birthing for Blokes website. There's Dads in Mind, uh, who have a WhatsApp group uh, through Bluebell. Mothers for Mothers have um, a telephone counselling support for, um, for dads. Um, there's also the Dads app, and, you know, just different ways of connecting with other dads maybe but also just about exploring how you might be feeling and the normalities and, and what might not be normal and when to get help just as we would as women as well but I think there's also you know a fear of judgment for dads and that that's kind of expressed in lots of different ways I think dads are more you know can can also experience things like PTSD and trauma from lots of different aspects of pregnancy and birth and new parenthood Mm. and feel disconnected from kind of feeding and things like that so kind of exploring different ways and avenues that you have in order whether it's from a therapeutic perspective or being able to have a conversation with another dad who's experienced the same things as you um, or it can come back to the you know the, the simple things for well-being again just like it does for us like you know getting exercise um you know sometimes having medication support and seeing the gp it can be 
um, yeah, joining groups or social support, or just having you know some banter and just general conversation with friends and reconnecting. It, it's about exploring what works for them, and it can come out in lots of different ways. I think maybe it's expressed in can be expressed in things like um, anger or disassociating, or you know trying not to talk about things at all. Um, there's lots of different. It's, it's a big topic, isn't it? But, there's um also things wrapped up in you know the it the phrase like daddy daycare it's not mm. you know it's that thing that dad is babysitting and not mm. actually you know an equal parent and there can be um that, that i think quite a lot gets wrapped up in that with trust of whether the father is doing the right thing you know changing the nappy feeding the baby um taking the baby to x group y group to the park holding the baby you know they they can often have quite a lot of judgment um particularly from in-laws or you know other people who look at mum as the primary caregiver so i think there's quite a lot wrapped up in how we talk about fathers um, and how potentially they're reacted to when a dad turns up to what is called a mummy group but often you know it should be a parenting group um, I think for all of us I you know being the person who walks up to them and says oh hi you know you've brought your baby along that's wonderful sitting and having a chat with them rather than you know them being excluded because they're a father and everybody else who's turned up is a mother um or at the park or you know uh, there's there's lots of places where i think dads are, are marginalized um whether it is yeah from language through to groups that they can go to and should we always have to have those separate groups where it's mums in one place and dads in another or should we be trying to bring some of those groups together so that a you can hang out more as a family with other families and it's not always about that separation but also you know you have your spaces where you have um the people who you can talk to about things that are only for mums or only for dads you know because you will have your own experiences that you'll want to talk through but we need that those spaces where the families are coming together as much and dads are treated equally community isn't it? Yeah, Finding it's community yeah yeah nick did you you were going to add something well just that you know i think that the, the changing times i mean there are loads more dads doing doing just as much care mm -hmm. as as mums these days and you know maybe society is struggling to keep up with that and there's mm. a lot of a lot of kind of ideas that, that that things should stay the same or that it's a bit weird or whatever and you know that i think that that is on the change but there are loads of groups as as claire was saying that there's some great you know provision for dads these days in bristol um mm. that i know of um and that to you know also you know the identity of a dad i mean and and of a mum. i mean it's like how much of myself am i going to you know be just just an individual is there is there a space for like just being myself just seeing my mates going out you know on mm. on occasion to do that as well as being having my role and my identity as, as a dad or a mum um at home so you know a healthy balance of, of, of you know maintaining yeah. you know, that connection. that language that's involved with that as well though isn't it when we're talking about a loss of identity or is it a change of identity or is yeah. it a growth of identity that you're yeah. not losing something you're building on top of that I and mean, mm. kind of you know that's a just... very good point like the expansion of, of yourself you know yeah. Expand, expanding into your new role um, yeah exactly. as, as much as having you know a change yeah, and allowing yourself to still do some of the things that you used to do yeah, <laughs> yeah allowing time to yeah. re reconnect with your old identity yeah. like you say it's an expansion it's not an yeah. off so. yeah. no that's it absolutely because you know okay you might not be able to do the hobby that you were doing as much as you were doing it before a baby arrived but it doesn't mean that having a short break whilst you get used to that transition that change working out how you fit that hobby back in mm. it doesn't mean that that has to disappear forever it means that there's a period of time it's like having a project at work where you have to work longer hours until that project's done and then once it's done you can breathe again you can go to the pub every night or do whatever you want to do it, it's the same isn't it with a baby it's just mm. 
a period of time where you're transitioning that's right and and then you can come back to some of those things and actually then you discover what is still important to you as well yeah it can be a great time to reevaluate all of that stuff you know yeah. what is important what are my priorities so changing priority as much as changing identity isn't it yeah yeah absolutely yeah so do we have any more questions from anybody there's nothing in my chat but if anybody would like to ask a question you can simply unmute yourself feel free okay well if nobody's got any more questions what i will do is i will open up the breakout rooms um and i'm just gonna yeah i'm gonna create breakout rooms with um i don't know maybe four or five people in um and everybody can hang out and um chat to other mums and dads whoever is on the call as you wish um um for and i'll just leave them open until the last person has gone so um i'll open those rooms now um and yes thank you so much everybody for being a part of this call it's been a really interesting discussion um thank you to claire charlie and nick as well like seriously for taking the time out of your work days we hugely appreciate it um i hope that um there have been some useful things useful takeaways from today's call i am going to go through everything and try and pull um some practical things in some sort of guide for everybody it won't be today but in the next couple of weeks and i will ping it over to everybody who's been on um this workshop so that you've got something tangible to take away as well um but yeah thank you and thank you for turning up but uh, it's it's been lovely to see you all so the rooms are open feel free to hang out and chat and um we'll see you all soon thanks for everyone thank you very much Bye. thank you thanks so much Bye. Bye.